Thank you very much for coming to our Halloween. Today we are going to read a bit of a scary story by Edgar Allan Poe. The title is The Pit and the Pendulum. We want to thank a group of students from Segundo de Bachillerato and many students from Primero and Segundo Eso with their Jack O' Lanterns in the corner. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. It might have been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, for I could take for a perfect note of time before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in next time when nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its below to a source must greater. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had perceptibly descended. I observed with what horror it is needless to say that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel about a foot in length from horn to horn. The horns upward and the other edge evidently a skin of that of a razor. Like a razor also it seems messy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid and broadest structure above. It was appended to a way the road of breast and the whole hisses it swung through the air. I could no longer dab the tomb prepared for me by monkish and journey and torture. My cognizant for the pit had become known to the inquisitorial agents, and the pit with horror had been destined for so bold a reaction as myself. The pit, typical of hell, and regarded by rumor of the ultima fuel of their punishment. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrainment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesque of this danger and death. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to hurl me into the abyss, and thus there being no alternative, a different and a milder destruction awaited me. I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such application, of such a thing. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror more than mortal, during which I counted the rushing vibrations of the steel. Inch by inch, line by line, which I descend only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages. Downed and still downed it came. Days passed. It might have been that many days passed. It swept so closely over me as to find me with its acrid breath. The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. I prayed. I wheeled heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself upward against the sweep of the fearful scimitar.
and then I felt suddenly calm and lay smiling at the glittering death as a child, a sun ray bubble. There was another interval of utter insensibility. It was brief, for upon again lapsing into life, there had been no perceptible descent in the pendulum. But it might have been long, for I knew there were demons who took note of my soul and who could have arrested the vibration of pleasure. Upon my recovery, too, I felt very, oh, inexpressibly sick and weak, as if through long inanition. Even amid the agonies of that period, the human nature craved food. my left arm as far as my bones permitted and took possession of the small remnant which had been spared me by the rats. As I put a portion of it within my lips, there rushed to my mind a half one thought of joy, of hope. Yet what business had I with hope? It was, as I say, a half one thought. Man has many such which are never completed. I felt that it was of joy, of hope, but felt also that it had perished in its formation. In vain, I struggled to perfect, to regain it. Long suffering had nearly annihilated all my ordinary powers of mind. I was an imbecile, an idiot. The vibrations of the pendulum was at right angles to my length. I saw that the crescent was designed to cross the region of the heart. It would fray the surge of my robe. It would return and repeat its operations again and again. Notwithstanding its terrifically wide sweep, some 30 feet or more, and the hissing vigor of its descent, sufficient to sunder these very walls of iron. Still, the fraying of my rope would be all that. For several minutes, it would accomplish. And at this thought, I paused. I dared not go farther than this reflection. I dwelt upon it with a pertinacity of attention, as if, in so dwelling, I could arrest here the descent of the steel. I forced myself to ponder upon the sound of the crescent as it should pass across the garment, upon the peculiar thrilling sensation which the friction of cloth produces on the nerves. I pondered upon all this frivolity until my teeth were on edge. Down, steadily down it crept. I took a frenzied pleasure in contrasting its downward with its lateral velocity. To the right, to the left, far and wide, with the shriek of a down spirit, to my heart with the stealthy pace of the tiger. I alternately laughed and howled as the one or the other idea grew predominant. of my bosom. I struggled violently, furiously to free my left arm. This was free only from the elbow to the hand. I could reach the latter from the platter beside me to my mouth with great effort but no farther. Could I have broken the fastings above the elbow, I would have seized and attempted to arrest the pendulum. I might as well have attempted to wrench an avalanche. Down, still and 
seizing me, still inevitably down. I gasped and struggled at each vibration. I shrunk convulsively as its every sweep. My eyes followed its outward or upward wells with the eagerness of the most unmeaning despair. They closed themselves spasmodically at the descent, although death would have been a relief. Oh, how unspeakable. Still I quivered in every nerve to think how slight a sinking of the machinery would precipitate that keen, glistening axe upon my bosom. It was hope that prompted the nerve to quiver, the frame to shrink. It was hope, the hope that triumphs on the rack, that whispers to the death condemned, even in the dungeons of the Inquisition.